Welcome to the bottom of the rabbit hole. Salute to you for tuning in to Matrix University, the number one spot for hardcore fans of the Matrix franchise. You are always appreciated. In this video, we are going to explore some of the direct connections between the Wachowskis and the comic book world. And if this is your first time down here, or you simply want to know everything about the Matrix universe, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you do not miss out on any yellow-pilled content. While promoting Bill and Ted 3, Keanu Reeves said the following. What, what'd you say, Keanu? I always wanted to play Wolverine. <laughs> it's not too late. It is too late. It's not too late for Keanu to play Wolverine. I'm just going to leave that there. I'm going to leave well. that there. I'm all good with it now. But that uh, was... No, I'm leaving that there. Did, right. Keanu, is that real? Did you really want to play Wolverine? Oh, yeah. Frank Miller's Wolverine, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Some of you may already know that Marvel has made several attempts to add Keanu Reeves to the MCU, which have all failed up to this point. Wolverine was one of my personal favorite comic book characters growing up. The first time Weapon X appeared was actually at the end of The Incredible Hulk issue number 180 in 1974. Wolverine then joined a revamped version of the X-Men by Chris Claremont in 1975. Frank Miller's version of the character is in reference to Wolverine numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. The 1982 four-part limited solo series debuted Wolverine's catchphrase, I'm the best there is at what I do, but what I do isn't very nice. Giving birth to the tougher and more modern anti-hero version of Wolverine that we all know so well today. In 1990, Frank Miller started working on a three-issue miniseries titled Hard Boiled with a highly praised and detailed artist that goes by the name of Jeff Darrow. For anyone here who doesn't know, Jeff Darrow is the lead concept artist for The Matrix. Jeff Darrow also did the artwork for the Matrix comic titled Bits and Pieces of Information, written by the Wachowskis, and later expanded into the second Renaissance episodes of the Animatrix. But we'll come back to Jeff a little later, because there is yet another degree of Wolverine connection deep within the depths of this rabbit hole. Around the same time Jeff Darrow was working on Hard Boiled with Frank Miller, Lana Wachowski was getting her first comic credit writing for Clive Barker's Hellraiser. In 1993, she wrote for the Clive Barker comic Ecto Kid, a project that served as the first big break for artist Steve Skrose. Skrose then went to work on the following Marvel series, Cable, X-Men, The Amazing Spider-Man in 96, and did pencil work for the Gambit series. Yes, that's totally who you think it is. Having previously worked with Lana Wachowski on Ecto Kid, Skrose was contacted to create storyboards for The Matrix which were then used by the Wachowskis to pitch the original Matrix movie to Warner. After the first Matrix movie, Skrose briefly returned to Marvel in 2000 to write and pencil four issues of, guess what? Wolverine. After that, he went on to draw storyboards for the rest of the Matrix trilogy. Steve Skrose also did storyboard work on V for Vendetta, Speed Racer, Ninja Assassin, Cloud Atlas, and Jupiter Ascending. In 2004, he co-created Doc Frankenstein, with comic book artist Jeff Darrow, which was written by, guess who, the Wachowskis. With all that history, it should be no surprise that both Jeff Darrow and Steve Skrose created the storyboard and concept art for The Matrix 4, as they were the first two artists hired for the original Matrix. Let's listen to what they have to say about their experiences working within the Matrix universe. Two artists who have similar creative DNA, uh, courtesy of the world of comic books, and two who will once again, quote, be sharing an office and trying to do a good job. Uh, the Oracle once said, we're all here to do what we're all here to do. Let's hear what these guys are here to do and we're there to do. Please welcome to Murmur into the Modern School of Film, two upgrades. Uh, Jeff Darrow, conceptual artist, Steve Skros, storyboard artist for The Matrix. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Hi there. Hello. I'd like to start out by saying two plus two makes a metaphor oh wow <laughs> you know talk about myopia um as i suffer from it happily in terms of movies sometimes but it's been 20 years does that mean anything to you all um sure but i guess you know it's like the anniversary is a little longer for us because it really started in because it really started kind of i guess in 96 for me for us or night was it 96 or 97 you 97 kind of, in 97, where, where the journey really began, where Jeff and I were the first two guys hired uh, for the Matrix to kind of do those initial drawings as part of their ongoing pitch process to Warners. Uh, Jeff, what about you? It's, it's amazing to me that I, I think I, I saw it on Facebook that it was 20 years that, that the movie had come out. So I was, well, it's the, the old classic. It's just, it's amazing. It's been 20 years. It just 
seems to me like I hate the corny at the yesterday. So we'll, we'll just speculate a little bit as is my want. Uh, knowing the Wachowskis, do you think it's popped into their mind? And I only say that because you know we were joking about you're getting on the freeway and you should never get back on the freeway obviously but you're getting back but do you think the 20 year mark occurred to them are they romantic in that way or is it a sort of different set of encyclopedias for them steve it's hard for me to say how romantic they are personally about uh, uh, anniversaries and 20 year marks i could see them you know revisit you know the, the anniversary had come and um you know so it was uh, on lana's mind again and um lana and lily kind of the inspiration for this new script um, sort of came out of, you know, they're, they're very close to their parents and they both passed last year, kind of was the inspiration for the idea of the new movie. When the fourth one was an idea, the iteration coming, was that a surprise at all or was it excitement? What was your reaction with the, the general idea of doing a fourth one? Um, well, at first I was, yeah, definitely surprised, you know, also not surprised. And then she told me the story and I read the script and, uh, yeah, I thought it was great. It was a great idea, actually. A very, I thought, worthy, uh, the script was very worthy of revisiting that world. And uh, I don't know, I think fans of it and new fans will find a lot in there. And Jeff, talking about timing and seeing it pop up, when was the last time you saw The Matrix? And do you ever kind of stop on it? when you're flipping through or is yeah that... it's 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 funny it I, whenever I, I do come across it i i just i i, I can't believe that i had anything to do with it it's just so amazing I'm a, it's, it was such an amazing experience i can't believe that that i was a part of it i i i'm living here in france they they show a lot of old shows and for some reason they've been showing this is gonna sound crazy the, the old hulk show and i'd never seen it but they had one on the villain in it was a corporation called the Matrix Corporation, <laughs> and and it was just so. I'd on top of it, the logo was in green. So it was, you know, it's just I don't know. I just kept thinking, I don't know, it's very odd. And maybe we'll start with a little bit of the simpler parts, the chronology. You know, you're talking about 1993, and I was thinking about maybe Steve. You interacted with the Wachowskis first right yeah we uh, i met the wachowskis through marvel uh you know i was like 18 or something and uh i just been hired to do some clive barker he had a series of of comics based on his concepts and the wachowskis were hadn't quite broken into show business yet and um they were hired as the writers for that and i was paired off with them to do this comic book called ecto kit you know they liked working with me and i liked working with them and so when they kind of you know, the year that we did that comic book, um, their career, they sold their first screenplay and the things, things started happening for them. And they sort of caught this wave and let me ride along on their coattails. <laughs> it sounds like you're referencing Assassins and I want to get Jeff in on Assassins. But before we do, you know, it's funny thinking about comic book collaborations. Those were the days where it wasn't just cell phone texts and PDFs. So I'm guessing you were interact. Were you interacting? I'm not. I'm not going to guess. I'm going to ask. Were you interacting in the room, the three of you? And if so, what were some of your impressions? And maybe the third qu question, if none of those appeal, were they ever talking about the Matrix, even in in vagaries? Were they talking about it at that time during Ecto Kid? Oh sure, yeah. I think they. Uh, I think it all happened around the same time in that year. I mean, they sold Assassins. And uh, yeah, back then it was mostly on the phone. We had, uh, I'd met up with uh, the Wachowskis at comic conventions, I guess over that period of time, a couple times and sort of got friendly with them that way. But yeah, they told me about the Matrix and uh, the, the initial version, you know, Neo had a little brother and um, it was a lot of the same elements, but there was, you know, more like uh, supporting characters and, uh, you know, Neo had this family, he wasn't quite this, this loner with no, that you didn't uh, know anything about him. Um, got uh, carved away as they tightened the script up. Was it something they had talked about as a trilogy? Do you remember any of the kind of future vision of The Matrix? Or was it one script, one movie, one idea at that time? Uh, no, I remember talk about a, a trilogy and um, yeah, they had a bunch of ideas in that direction. But, you know, in the beginning, you're kind of, you've got to focus on making the first one. But uh, yeah, they didn't, they had no lack of ideas for um where the story should go. Jeff, I want to, you know, it's ironic. We're talking about timeline and it's easy to locate you 
connecting with the Wachowskis in the early mid '90s, but it's really they knew your work from Hard Boiled, which you did with Frank Miller. But talk a little bit about those first, uh, you know, connections to them. And oh yeah, I remember where I was standing when I got the call because they told me, "Well, we got the Wachowskis who want you." And I didn't know who they were. I said, "Excuse me, I don't know who that is." And they said, "Well." They've got a movie. They did this movie uh, called Bound. At the time, it hadn't even come out yet. They said, "They said, well, they also wrote a script for a film called Assassins." And I was, well, yeah, well, I know that. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to read it and see if it was something I thought I could draw, because I didn't want to agree to work on something and then do a really, you know, which I probably did anyway, a lousy job. I, I just, I, I it was something I could physically do. And uh, I remember at the time, I think, I think it was Lana told me that, like, Silver's like, who does he think he is? Blah, 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 blah. But they thought it was funny <laughs> because they said he, he, they liked the fact that I had asked. And they, they sent it to me, and I, I said, I said, I don't know if I can, but I sure would like to try. The first thing they had me draw was the uh, the power plant. plant. And I, you know, they would sit there and they described him to me as being like a, they're like these bulbs that are petals and a flower kind of surrounding the stalk. And I, 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 I actually afterwards they told me they said it wasn't you drew you didn't draw what we thought you were going to draw because I, uh, my visualize it as this gigantic thing and they didn't see it that big. They saw them smaller, but I drew this you know almost you know skyscraper type thing that with all these things plugged into it and. Uh, I remember them telling me that it was at that time everything was by fax, and I remember them telling me they were laughing because it was coming through the fax. It was like, because <laughs> it was the drawing, the gray and the line that was so right. intense that it took a certain amount of time for it to actually come through. But they liked it, and then, and then we were off and running. But I still I was always like, ah, well, I got lucky this time. The next one, they're gonna they'll cut me loose. So. It was we. It was great because we talked movies. We talked a lot about movies we'd seen, and you know, did you see this? You know that? Da da da. Fun. Were, were you talk? We're speaking with Jeff Darrow and Steve Scrooge. Were you talking about modern movies, or were you, were you talking about? Yeah, all kind of old movies, and you know, do you like Lubitsch? Do you like Sturgis? Do you like uh, Bud Boddicker? Have you ever seen anything? Do you know who Kenji Masumi is? Have you ever seen any Hideo Gosha films? How about you know that and, and, and it, you know just back and forth and Billy Wilder and just just you know all the and you know they were they knew everything and it was just fun to you know because I mean you know <laughs> you talk to people now they don't know any of these guys anymore. I want to sit with the script for a little bit here as we move towards a midsection. And it's funny, a lot of actors were kind of not vexed, but kind of what is this and what what are we what's going on here? Start with Jeff. Jeff, when you read it. Obviously, you had a task in your mind, but did you cons- comprehend it? And I'm not trying to b- sound condescending. I'm not saying like on, on an analytical level. Was it different scriptologically? Do you know what I mean? And and in the sense of how much of the detail, not your exquisite artistic detail, but how how were the plants and the harvesting fields described in the script? How were they described? Was it with a fine tooth comb, or were there latitudes that you could oh. explore? No, but, on your own. No, I, I can't say it was like a fine tooth comb, but reading one of their scripts, because you know I've worked in some movies, reading scripts isn't always a lot of fun. But reading their scripts are like reading like a novel. I mean, they're they're fun. I mean, they just put enough information up to, to, as they did in the Matrix to paint that picture in your head. But they're not they're not you know like um, cliff notes like a lot of scripts are. I, I, I just. I mean, a lot of it came from just sitting and talking to them about what they wanted it to look like. But it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't spelled out like 100 percent, as I recall. It's been so long. Steve, what about you in the sense of, you know, looking at your part of it as a storyboard artist? Did you ever read the original and think, how the F are we going to do this? Pictorially, one image I'm zeroing in on and it, the dojo fight uh, between Keanu and Lawrence, where Kia, where Lawrence is, is ascended at an incredible height to de, only to descend down on Keanu while they're fighting. And if you look at the ratio of objects, that's not a sort of typical cinematographic ratio of objects. You know, you have this man flying way up in the air. It's, an, it's breathtaking to look at. Was that on the page, that kind of grandeur 
Oh no, they had that. That would that that was in those days. I mean, yeah, they they had all that kind of fully cooked. So in a lot of ways, it was kind of just like drawing comics because we were doing big graphic images. They liked really uh, detailed boards, and they wanted, you know, the same way their scripts. They treated their scripts like literature on their own, where they would be like just as entertaining reads. The the boards and even the concept art were were kind of the same, where they were also kind of you know taken to the limit, and on their own, they were sort of um, more than just、um, blueprints for something else. They kind of allowed the artists. To you know, be artists as well and、uh, create something that was interesting on its own, which I think sort of helped them, you know, sell the thing. Did you storyboard any of the let's call them acting scenes? And I'm not being cheeky. I'm just saying that <sighs> they wanted some emotional moments. Like I think I, I drew the kiss. You know, when the Trinity kisses him, and it kind of he wakes up、Where、in the Matrix shot, and the、yeah. Sentinels. Yeah. yeah, so that's kind of an, a non-actiony, but it's all tied into the action anyway.、Uh, maybe, but you know, hard to say. Probably not too much. I remember one particular sequence where Steve was working on, and、uh, and Lana and Lily were were carpenters or house builders, and so they knew a lot about construction. And there was one scene where they escape in, into the walls. And they're talking. Do you remember that, Steve? They're talking about. Well, you know, yeah, but there'd be pipes, and they describe what would be between the walls, which I'd never thought of or heard of, and they were just so meticulous. And there would be this type of,、uh, you know, wood, and there'd be this type of the lathe, the, the, the lathe, yeah, yeah and the, the kind of, kind of old school、there. plaster and wood. That's how they would do old, old buildings. And I guess they came across a lot of that in Chicago. And <clears throat> yeah, it was very specific. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool, and no one really had thought of that, or we no one had really seen that before, or since, quite frankly, in in my humble estimation. You know, Steve, you know, I was thinking about、uh, Blade Runner. I usually think about Blade Runner, but you know, I was thinking about、uh, Ridley Grams. I don't know if you're familiar with or you saw Ridley's drawings for Blade Runner. Oh、uh, yeah, I've seen them. Yeah, they kind of have a Mobius flair. Yeah, ironically, Jeff Darrow. But、um, you know, it's funny they're works of art, and yours are works of art. I think with the Wachowskis, it, it's not a it's not a question. It's A statement. Sitting with storyboards for a second, my film students want to know how were the Wachowskis? How were they as storyboard artists? You can tell me. They're not going to hear this. They weren't bad, uh, especially uh, uh, Lily Wachowski. Her drawings were pretty good. You know, I think one or two drawing classes, and I would have been out of a job. But luckily, they were busy <laughs> with other things.、Uh, here with Steve Scross and Jeffrey Darrow. You know, was I was also thinking about Mobius. You know, we talked. <laughs> Steve mentioned him, and obviously, friend, mentor, colleague to you. Jeff, but he has you know we talk about Ridley Scott and and these Halcyon sci-fi films. What about Alien? Did Mobius ever talk about brief work doing concept art for Alien along the way? Did you ever chew his ear a little bit? Yeah, we talk. Well, we we talk we talk about about doing concept work. And I'm not a kind of guy. And, and he said this to me. He says he could if you say I want you to draw I don't know a, a spacesuit. He said I'll give you one. Maybe two tries on it, and that's it. And I'm the kind of same way. I can't keep doing the thing over and over and over because it's just the law of diminishing returns. I mean, I'll, I'll give you everything on the first one, 75% on the next one, but after that, I just I just lose interest. And we we talk about that same sort of similar thing. In fact, I would tell people that I said I'm not going to do that. I won't do things over and over. I'll do it once, and that's it. And maybe twice, but I, maybe I picked it up from him. But with that similar.、Um, Uh, ethic in terms of work ethic in terms of working on movies, and I, I you know, I, I know he, he, I mean, he was just so prolific. Hodorowski's Dune, which has a, you know, a, it's like the 1927 Yankees in terms of collaborators, <laughs> you know, from Giger to Mobius and on and on. I'm sorry, Jeff, if I interrupted you,、oh, but no, yeah, no. I was thinking he's sort of in an interesting center. Uh, or left of center of of these worlds,、um, you know. It was also before we talk a little bit about the making and then wrap up. You know, I was wondering for you, we can pose this for both of you. Maybe start with Jeff. You know, thinking about bringing worlds to life and world building, which is such a badass thing. W- did you have any visual frame of reference, and did the real world、uh, cock block you to create this harvested world, this scorched earth world? No, I. You know. When I draw something, I always start out with one little, one little detail, and if I can think I can get that right, I can sort of extrapolate from it, and it kind of grows outward. A lot of those matrix drawings were extremely 
organic. I mean, uh, they're all based on Giger, and Giger for me so much is Mobius because he had the same thing—a sort of a, a, a biomechanical feel to it. He would he would draw things that looked like animals, but they weren't animals; they were machines. And so I would, I kind of got that from him, and I would, like I say, just look at his skeletons and such, and just extrapolate from there. It, it, uh, and I always try to put something there because I mean I always try to make things kind of look like they would kind of work a little bit so that I don't think there's a lot of I don't do a lot of like what you call fantasy mechanics on some of the major shows that these guys would come in and they would they would do things and they'd always have every bolt would be different on this machine and they'd say well you know if this thing was built it would they wouldn't they would be each section would be look like it was manufactured. Good thing you weren't visiting IKEA at the time. Everything would have needed an L wrench. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried going to yeah, IKEA in, in Tokyo. There's something for you. Uh, you know, I was thinking, Steve, before we get to some final beats. You know, not to go back to kind of wire work, but a lot of the physics of the film didn't exist, and I think that's still, you know, maybe to a generation into a world, maybe an Eastern tradition of filmmaking. We talked about Wuxia films uh, and John Woo films, which you know we knew about here in the west and, and new but talk a little bit about that talk a little bit about conceiving physics well <clears throat> initially what they were interested in is uh there was a guy making kung fu movies by the name of yun wu ping who ultimately wound up being their um choreographer and uh, i think he was the stunt coordinator and so they took you know a lot of their ideas or all their ideas and presented them to him and he's the one and his team who figured out how to do all that um, they'd been doing a lot of all that stuff, these physics-defying uh, moves for years in Hong Kong, but no one had ever thought to do that in a Western uh, movie. And Warner's, I remember at the time, was a little reticent of hiring this this guy that they'd never worked for. They had their own stunt people and uh, their own idea about how wire work should uh, work. You know, you can see some of that and say... Uh, uh, the Batman and the Robin, which I think was like, you know, there was some kind of winch and a machine that would haul a guy up and, and all the wire work that looked great in, in uh, the Chinese movies was, was all done by guys pulling you up. I think that's, that's what made the Matrix stand out is that they, they brought in this guy to, to do that. For me and, and our process, you know, I didn't really think I was just drawing, so I didn't really have to worry about any of that. I know that... Uh, when they would show it to executives, there'd be a lot of questions about, like, how are we going to do this? And uh, they kind of had the answers. It's this guy, Wu Ping. Before the execution, were you ever involved with uh, Master Wu Ping? Yeah, not really. I don't. I, the thing about my job is I'm sort of like, a storyboard artist is almost like the scout of a big army. They send you, you, you go off ahead of everyone else and uh, sort of like see what the lay of the land is. And then you come back and uh, then the army goes in. So I work pretty much in isolation generally in most films or in an art department during pre-production. So you're not, the whole team isn't isn't really fired up yet. You sort of draw the movie first as the phase, first phase and then you bring in everyone else who's going to figure out how to uh, accomplish it all. How long did the whole storyboarding, sorry to interrupt, but how long did the whole process take? Well, the first one, I feel like it was six to a little less, than maybe six to eight months over a couple of years. So I would come out for a couple of weeks and then I would... And the movie was constantly being like dying. Like uh, the yeah. last time I worked on the original Matrix, uh, when I left, oh, it wasn't going to be made. There's no way they're going to make yeah. it. And they, 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 the they, thing they... about Wachowskis is they have a, a knack for convincing people. Um, they have a lot of charisma and they like, they're, you know, very brilliant. And they, you believe them when they tell you something's going, that they can do something. And uh, that's how they convinced Warners to go to this, through this unconventional route. Uh, route. And uh, yeah, it paid off. Yeah, because they had Warner's at one point. They, they they said we want you to do this movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger based on this Richard Matheson novel called The Last Man on Earth. And if you go and you make this movie, because I guess Arnold had asked for them to direct it, and he said if you go and you make this this movie, we'll let you do your little science fiction film. And they turned it down. They just they 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 wanted to put their vision on on the screen, and and. Um, they did it. They, I mean, they they figured it out. They were the guys that came up with uh, with Keanu, and uh, through Keanu, they got the film made, as I would call it. As our Steve remembers it that way. Yeah, I think so. That's what I was just going to say. They 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 had the uh, the Keanu metric. No movie he had ever made worldwide had lost money, and uh, yeah. so all the movies that before that that you 
or I would say super notable. He had this wide appeal that um, they couldn't deny. What do you think sold him on the script? The script? Mm. He, loved, he he was, and they had several guys that came in, I'm not going to mention any names, and he got it. He understood all of it. There were some people that came in that you would have thought were fairly clever, and they, they couldn't wrap their head around it, but Keanu did. They had Keanu, and he was into it. Uh, they had his, uh, you know, pedigree of, of uh, success at the box office. And what they did with our artwork and a couple other guys is they went made these giant books, these flip books that were, uh, you know, the, you know, kind of like a film aspect ratio size, you know, very large kind of coffee table book. And they would go up and have these meetings with, uh, like I said, Terry Semo and other executives, and they would flip through the book and between each scene, uh, they would have like a black card with a, a line of dialogue from the movie. And then they, the, the executives would flip through the book that had our artwork in it and these like little um, snippets of um, dialogue from the movie. And uh, that's how it sort of, they was, it played like they were watching it. And I think when they did that, when they had the artwork, uh, they, I don't know, maybe they didn't completely understood, understand, but they understood that it was cool. <laughs> and that maybe yeah. these guys were cooler than uh, the the old fo uh, folks that were running show business at the time and, and if i could i'd like to mention there were two other guys in that room and that was there was tani kunatani who did an amazing job on it he was right. essential to the team and colin grant another gentleman did a lot of great work on the film so i just want to mention them because they deserve a lot of credit too and who was the other concept artist uh warren manzer warren manzer the other yeah. Guy. yeah did some nice nice pieces too it's, again, it's like you guys are like the 27 Yankees. Um, wrapping up here with Jeffrey Darrow and Steve Scross, you know, I was thinking, Jeff, you made it out there. Uh, you're in the film, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the, I'm, 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 I'm triplets in the film, wow. actually. Actually, it was, at one point, I was going to be like one of the elders in the, the cave scene, but. Uh, <laughs> I they told there. Jeff had too much gravitas for the uh, for the actors. Yeah. <laughs> Fishburne, yes. I was a scene stealer. I was the Alan Hale of, of the production. Of that. Look, <laughs> like, if this guy's on here, I'm walking. So, so they put me in. Uh, <laughs> put me on my on, on, on one of the APUs. Uh, well, uh, three of me actually. I'm triplets. Do you have any stardust memories of the set or any memories seeing the physicalization of things? What was that like? Oh, gosh. Wow. I, I just remember one time going to when they were filming that, the big dance sequence in Zion, and uh, <coughs> Tom Waits came to this set with his kids, which was kind of odd because he, he didn't look like the Tom Waits guy that I knew. He looked like one of the Beach Boys, but it was kind of cool seeing him there. But yeah, seeing all that stuff built is just. Yikes! But I'm not. But I actually came to the set that was on the sequels, actually. But and those are, I saw more of those sets than because I didn't visit Australia on the on the first film. But I saw the set. They brought it to, to uh, Warner's for the uh, press conference, and I remember um, Lana took me on the set to see it because it was a drawing that I had done, and she had to argue with the the security people because they wouldn't let her on. She's like, "This is my set." <laughs> I, I love that. You know, I was thinking as we look at now the birth of the film, as we say goodbye, I was thinking, you know, the film, people forget it was an Oscar winning film. And one of the Oscars was was editing. And just to, to throw that at you, Steve, first, because I, I think, again, there's a relationship that editors and storyboard artists have. I always think editing is really screenwriting. You're literally writing for the screen, as are you. As, as the storyboard artist, Steve, but did you feel anything good, bad, neutral when it won uh, Oscar for best editing? Did you th did you feel the the silver ball of what you had done hit that silver ball? Well, yeah, I mean, it was like, yeah, it was like the coolest thing in, in, in cinema uh, for, for years. And even now, kind of, I think, you know, hold a championship belt. Um, you know, it was just an amazing experience to be a part of that and to work with Jeff. It was just to talk about Jeff for a second. It was amazing. You know, you know, it was amazing to one of the blessings of my creative life was to uh, work with him and uh, spend uh, time with him. And uh, well, I mean, that's why I'm specifically saying creative life. I mean, on a personal level, that's another <laughs> point of talk. Yeah. The word Hindenburg comes to mind. Yes, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just say I'm I'm talking to Gloria Allred right now. Uh, oh, ouch. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's a low bar, Steve. Anyway, go on. <laughs> There's a lot of fun in that room. There's a lot of, you know, I mean, 
a great, great, great brotherhood grew out of that that uh, that meeting. And uh, Steve is an amazing artist and uh, an amazing, very, very amazing human being because he's very good natured. And it, we just we had a lot of fun because I mean, there's all kinds of stories that just things that happened on that thing just with everybody wanted to be I in know. that movie and uh, people oh, would yeah, come yeah, in totally. can't even uh, the famous concert you remember the concert Steve? yeah What's Lauren name? Hill Lauren Hill came in and so she was sitting in this kind of waiting area that was right outside her office and she while she was there she just started playing guitar so we had like this sitting at our desk just getting this private concert from her and she, she didn't she even think come in to get a part she just wanted to meet them because it was like the movie yeah. was so important to her and yeah, and she had, because she thought that, that that the movie was a message from God, and that by playing music to them, they were like a telephone line to God. That was something. Sadly, sadly, we were the ones who heard it, so it was more like a yes. a call to yeah. purgatory, or in my case, hell. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> well, there goes next week's guest, Ms. Lauren Hill. But everybody was coming through the office to be in that. We met. God, I don't know. You know John Milius came in and. Uh, Gosh, so many, so many. I mean, because he was—he was a funny character. Don Cheadle and just, just I can go on and on. What and J- uh, Janet Jackson? We just wanted to be in this thing. Wow, I would be remiss. You are going back into those rooms again. Those rooms that you guys lived in and had so much fun. I oh, we did. Are you going to watch any of the other installments? Or are you going to watch the original to prep your mind? Or is well, we've it... already finished, right? We've already yeah. finished our time on Matrix, Matrix Four. Yeah, we were there in the summer and. Uh... Our part is done there. They're geared up yeah. now. Yeah, yeah Lauren, Lauren Hill is trying to Google Earth them. Um, well, the other question, uh, Lily didn't come back for this. A- any vagary around why, or not vagary, but just even even something that, it doesn't have to be gossip. I'm just wondering, it's a kind of, from my vantage, which is an uninformed vantage, it's, it is a bit of a, a spot on, on this iteration. Uh, why do you, why do you think? I mean, I don't want to put you in a weird spot, but I'm, I I, got, I have to ask, quite frankly. Well, she's she's working on another project, so I, I think it's just that the time didn't work out, and um, that's all I can add to it. Cause I... <laughs> Let me twist it a little bit differently, Steve. Was it different without the sisters as a duo? Um, oh yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's uh, it's a little different, but uh, yeah, Lily was definitely uh, missed. But uh, you know, people's lives go in different directions, and uh, you know, everyone you know has uh, different interests. And you get older, and you make different decisions about what you want to do with your time, you know. And uh, but uh, everyone's still friends and all that stuff. So uh, not not too much gossip, but. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the way it went. Thinking about 1999 again as we say goodbye for the fourth time. But, you know, director duos weren't really ubiquitous. They're still not. Could you give us just a parting shot, maybe starting with Jeff and then Steve? What made them work well together during the original Matrix? Like, what is the yin yang? Well, I always found, I mean, they're both very funny, but I always found Lily had such a great sense of humor, even in, in, in moments of. Um, great duress she was very good at bringing out but they both are but at least to me the, the best in me because she would make me feel feel good about myself and i think that she does that they both do it in people but I, I, lana is very reflective and very thoughtful and and so so is lily but lily's but we bring a great sense of joy and humor to things uh yeah they work a little differently they're a little looser these days you know they're a little more you know um yeah, open, collaborative, you know, there's a lot of stuff moving, you know, um, you know, a, a lot of, you know, uh, making it better, a lot of revising. So um, in the earlier days, it was pretty much, yeah, very, a lot of, they, you know, Lana and Andy or Lily would spend a lot of time, you know, to get figuring out what they wanted. And then they would bring me in and I would just essentially draw it up. So these days it's been a lot more, you know, um, free form. Did this film achieve a vision, and do we think too much about this movie or not enough? Well, I don't know. I can't speak for other people thinking too much about it. I mean, it's a great movie. It's a classic. Uh, the trilogy uh, I love, I think what The Matrix says is that no matter what sort of corporate algorithms or whatever the bean counters say, um, you know, when you're making corporately funded art, that, uh, that they want you to think that they know what will be a success. 
and they want you to think that they know, but no one really knows uh, what people will want to see until you make something that uh, people want to see. And The Matrix yeah. is an example of how um, art is still going to determine uh, what people see in the theaters and whether or not they like it or, or, or will connect to it, not uh, you know, corporate, uh, corporate driven algorithms or anything else. Professor Darrow, uh, your thought on it. Is this film something that is in the time capsule? Is it a film that 20 years later we're, we're caring about too much, not enough, or just about the right amount? Oh, I, I think it's a very important film. I, for me, it's, it's the Citizen Kane of science fiction films. It's, 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 I mean, it's not a cure for cancer, but, but it, it, it changed so many things. I mean, uh, in, ter- in terms of film, film language, and, I mean, how many people can add something new to film? You know, I think, I think they managed to do it, and they did it without really thinking about it in terms of do it, thinking they were going to change anything. They, they did it because it was a film made with a great amount of love and sacrifice from, from hiring people like Steve and myself to hiring certain actors that, that the studio didn't want. They did it because it was, that was their vision. And, uh, it's, a, it's a film that's a lot about love. Sometimes the planets line up, but the inhabitants of those planets matter, and you guys were on those planets. So I want to thank you. Just like Keanu Reeves, Steve Scross, and Jeff Darrow all mentioned missing Lily Wachowski's presence during the production. Darrow also brought up that The Matrix is a lot about love, which I think often gets lost when talking about the films. And Reeves did mention there being a bit of a love story included in The Matrix 4. So while Keanu Reeves didn't get to play Wolverine on the big screen, Steve Scrooge definitely got paid to draw both of them. And as a fan of both franchises, I think that connection is pretty cool. If you like this kind of yellow pill content, be sure to share it on other platforms like Facebook, Reddit, Twitter. And remember, as one realizes that one is a dream figure in another person's dream, that is self-awareness.